I'm Rebecca with 1C, and this is Silent Crash. I've been in the story industries for 17 years. I'm a best-selling writer and producer, but more importantly than that, I know stories. I memorized my first one when I was four and wrote my first one at eight. Stories are how I see and understand the world. So when I got a call from a woman in Michigan telling me about what's happening there and asking if I could somehow help, my brain went to work trying to understand the story at play. What she was telling me felt too off, too unbelievable to be true. Vulnerable people, car crash survivors, dying because of a new law? Suddenly losing the care they had for decades? Even though billions of dollars are sitting in a fund for that very purpose? It couldn't be true. I mean, government can be bad, yes, but not kill you on purpose and refuse to stop bad. Right? But this was Michigan, I reminded myself. Home of the Flint water crisis. Hmm. Could this woman be right in what she was telling me? I thought there had to be a part of the story she'd simply missed. A part that, when she knew it, would fix everything easily. I told her I'd look into it. And I did. I started reading, researching, and talking to the people involved. Now, normally, I don't put a story out for public consumption until I know how it will end. I want to bring people something that is polished and ready. I initially started putting this podcast together in that way. But the further in I got, the more I began to suspect there is a much larger story lurking beneath the surface. My senses are on high alert. There's something sinister afoot here. I keep brushing up against it with each subsequent interview. I've uncovered enough and connected enough to suspect that whatever is going on won't stop until it's seen. So I'm inviting you into this unfolding story journey now, rather than wait until I have it all figured out. Just by listening, by adding yourself to the growing number of listeners here, you make it impossible for the tale to live only in the dark. And I think it's the light that's going to save them. Here's what I know so far. In 1973, Michigan's auto no-fault system began. Before this, if you were in a car accident, you had to sue the other driver who was at fault in order to get your medical care covered. This new legislation, though, did away with that. Instead, victims would make a claim with their own insurance companies, no matter who was at fault. Before this, you you weren't required to have auto insurance in Michigan, so long as you paid $45 a year into a fund for uninsured people. When auto no-fault passed, though, everyone was then required to have insurance. And that created a new problem. See, insurance is, it's really a gamble at the end of the day, right? You're paying a little bit each month on the gamble that one day you'll need much more money than you put in. Insurance companies take your money each month on the gamble that you'll never need more in benefits than you put in. The gamble works out for the insurance companies most of the time, which is why they're quite profitable. Insurance companies look at lots of factors in deciding what kind of gamble to offer you. In Michigan, where everyone suddenly had to have insurance, it was a bigger gamble for them to offer auto insurance in some places over others. For instance, the odds of a Detroit insurance customer making a claim that his car had been stolen were higher than those for someone in another part of Michigan. So, the insurance company raised the rate for the people in Detroit. People objected. They were required to have insurance, and yet the insurance rates being offered were just unaffordable. The issue went all the way to the Michigan Supreme Court, who ruled in 1978 that the no-fault law was allowed but that if insurance was going to be mandatory, it had to be offered at, quote, fair and equitable prices. 
As the Detroit Free Press reported it, this led to, quote, a territorial system that forbade insurers from charging rates that were less than 45% of the highest territory and imposed tighter rules for adjacent territories. So if they were charging the Detroit guy, say, $100, they couldn't charge the guy in the Upper Peninsula less than $45, even if it would have made sense to only charge him $30. Now, I know we're getting into the weeds here, but the, but the backstory has to be known to understand the current story that's unfolding. So stick with me. Also in 1978, the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Association was started. You'll want to remember that name, the MCCA. Each person would pay an annual fee to their auto insurers. The insurers would then send that fee to the MCCA to build up a fund to pay for the most serious and expensive auto injury claims. At the start, the fee was only about $60 a year. In 2019, it was about 220 So when claims exceeded a certain amount, in 2019 it was $560,000, the claims could still be made, but the insurance company would just push the claim through to the MCCA. The MCCA would pay the claim to the insurance company, and then the insurance company would push the money on through to the person making the claim. If you've ever been in an auto accident or had any care in a hospital, you know that $560,000 doesn't cover very much. But people in Michigan didn't have to worry about that because they had the MCCA. In 1992 and 1994, Michigan voters loved this program so much that they went to the polls and they beat back legislators' attempts to end the no-fault program. Over time, gradually, lawsuits against the at-fault drivers faded away. See, the lawyers realized it's easier to make a PIP, a personal injury protection claim, because those claims, you only had to prove that an accident had happened and a person needed care or treatment. So their system settled into place. If you were in a catastrophic car crash, you knew that the invoices for your care, all of your care, which includes not just medicine and doctors, but ongoing therapies, equipment, home modifications, in-home care, all of it would be covered by the MCCA fund. That's what you paid into every year so that everything you needed would be covered. As a result, Michigan became known as a place where nobody would be forced into bankruptcy by medical bills stemming from an auto crash. It also became the home of significant advancements in brain injury recovery because that care was now covered. Doctors and medical researchers could invest time in developing therapies and techniques because they were being paid to help the patient find recovery no matter how long it took. Now, if you've been rushed through a doctor visit in 15 minutes, you know how valuable a doctor's time and attention are. Imagine having a doctor who could knowingly spend whatever amount of time it took to help you recover. That was Michigan. But then, in 2019, a perfect storm blows up. I'm still sussing out the full story here because it doesn't all make sense yet. So far, it involves... The mayor of Detroit, Mike Duggan, a Democrat, and the richest man in Detroit, Dan Gilbert, who owns Quicken Loans, and he's donated so much more to Republican campaigns than Democratic ones, coming together, these two men came together to approach the governor. It also involves that governor, Gretchen Whitmer, she's a Democrat. She ran for governor on the slogan, Fix the Damn Roads. It involves a Republican-majority state legislature, whose leaders ran on finally ending auto no-fault in Michigan. It involves powerful lobbying money from the insurance industry and leaders of the watchdog organizations having significant conflicts of interest. In this perfect storm of May 2019, reforms to auto no-fault were passed. Now, you should know that this was done in a most unusual way. The call went out for a special legislative session on Friday. The Michigan legislature normally didn't meet on Fridays, so this on its surface was already unusual, and not everyone understood why the session was being called. But the lawmakers showed up, the Senate and the House, in Michigan. And 
Over the course of the next few hours, it became apparent why they were there. They were there to pass legislation that would reform the auto no-fault program. That became apparent by 10 o'clock, and then 11 o'clock, and then midnight, and 1 a.m. And around 2.30 in the morning is when the House passed the Senate's version of auto no-fault reform. It's Public Acts 21 and 22. There was no opportunity given for public testimony, public scrutiny. None of that was there. It was the middle of the night. But they took the vote, and they passed it. Some of the legislators we know now were told by their leadership, don't worry about it. Whatever's broken in this, we'll fix it later. They were also told, don't worry about it. This will not apply to any of the 18,000 people who are currently reliant upon the MCCA program to pay for their medical care. Turns out, neither of those things was true. A few days later, the lawmakers joined the governor for their annual retreat on the exclusive Mackinac Island. This is this island is kind of known. It's, it's been in movies. It's, it's known as an exclusive place for the rich people to gather. There aren't even cars allowed on the island. The no-fault auto reform legislation was hailed by the governor as a big bipartisan victory. She had crossed the aisle and held hands with the Republican majority to reform auto no-fault in Michigan. But why? Why did she get in bed with Republicans? Why did she sign a piece of legislation that she had promised she would never allow? Why did she not deliver her promised veto? Does it have anything to do with her dad being the former head of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan? Or maybe their $144,000 single night raise for her campaign? Or the presence of the current head of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan on her gubernatorial transition committee? Was it a promise by Dan Gilbert to use his considerable wealth to persuade the Republican lawmakers in control of both the House and the Senate to release funds for her to fix the damn roads? Why did she do this? And why has she not fixed it since? Did the attempt by some of those Wolverine watchmen to kidnap and potentially kill Governor Whitmer in 2020 leave her unwilling to take a hard stance against Republicans in her state and fix this legislation? What did Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan end up getting out of this? His residents are still paying the highest insurance premiums in the country, so it's not that. What benefit did he or his city receive? I don't know any of those answers for sure yet, but I'm digging. The two worst parts of the reform legislation, the parts that are causing catastrophic damage in people's lives now, didn't take effect until July 2nd of this year, 2021. Why? Is that because it would be past the deadline for another referendum at the polls to beat this back once more? That's another question I'm working to answer. Because they are two incredibly awful, dangerous parts to this legislation impacting 18,000 people. The first one is a 45% cut in medical coverage mostly to post-acute care. Post-acute care is 90% of the care that catastrophic car accident patients need. Post-acute care means things like rehab services. One mom told me about her son who has a traumatic brain injury from a car accident that happened when he was four. He's 11 now. He's a student in a public school, and he's made incredible progress from years of therapy. Before the cut in coverage, her boy went to rehab three to five days per week after school for both occupational and speech therapy. Now, he gets a half hour a week for both. That's 15 minutes for speech therapy, 15 minutes for occupational. She's already seeing him regress. An 11-year-old little boy who had a hope of recovering to the point of being on his own when he's an adult, now going backward. Post-acute things are things like transportation services. It's not easy to get traumatic brain injury patients and paraplegics and quadriplegics and other survivors of catastrophic car injuries to the rehab facilities that they need. It requires specially equipped vans and trained drivers. Yet those companies are now being paid only 55% of what they were paid before this new law. They'd have to have had profit margins of 45% to withstand this, and they certainly did not. 
One owner of such a company told me she's having to decide now if she's going to take out a mortgage against her house or some other kind of loan to keep providing transportation to her patients. She's tried to cut costs by doubling up on how many people she puts in a van at once, but that's dangerous because brain injury patients can be volatile when stuck in enclosed spaces with strangers. And even doing that, she can't get her costs low enough to work at that 45% fee cut. When she goes out of business, though, she knows that those patients won't have a way to get to their rehab anymore. What can she do? Home health attendants, that's another part of post-acute care. I talked to a man who owns a home health attendant company. He's saying he has one more month of payroll that he can cover. And then he'll have to close his doors, just like the other 41 health care providers have already done. He worries about the patients that he and his staff have cared for for years. What will happen when no one is there to change them, feed them, turn them to prevent bed sores, move their limbs to prevent muscle atrophy while they recover? To be clear, Michigan does not have enough residential care facilities, nursing homes, to take these patients in. The existing nursing homes aren't set up to care for catastrophic car accident patients anyway. I've been told that both insurance companies and hospitals are working on building facilities. That's another question I'm trying to get to the bottom of. Did they lobby to cut pay so that they could build facilities of their own? Oh, and that 45% cut... It was a cut based on what was charged for the service in 2019. I want to make sure that sinks in here too. Whatever a company charged for a service in 2019, this new legislation said that company could only get 55% of that cost two years later. It's just one more example of how weird and screwed up this legislation is. Can you imagine If someone tried to tell the oil and gas industry that they could only charge us 55% of what we paid for gas in 2019 today? Or what if we told farmers they could only get paid 55% of the price of a gallon of milk in 2019? How many farmers do you think would instantly go out of business? That's what's happening in Michigan. A driver who was maybe getting $14 an hour to drive patients to rehab is now supposed to get $7.70 an hour? That's not even minimum wage in Michigan. Minimum wage in Michigan is nine forty-five. And then there's the second catastrophic part of this legislation: the the cut to attendant reimbursement from twenty-four-seven care to fifty-six hours per week. Now, this one gets a little detailed, so hang with me. This affects the family, friends, and anyone who knew the person before the accident who is now providing care. See, before this legislation, a family member could decide to give up his or her job to take care of the patient in the home. They could submit their hours to the MCCA and be paid for the care they provided. Now, let me be clear here. The reimbursement wasn't a lot. It rarely replaced the income the family member gave up, and it did nothing to offset the lack of 401k and insurance and other benefits that came from the former job. But it helped make it possible for a mom, a dad, a wife, a husband, or another family member to handle the feedings and changings and physical therapy practices and transportation and everything else right at home instead of pushing their family member off into a facility or having strangers in their home 24-7. Now, though, that family member can only submit a claim for 56 hours in the week, and that 56 hours includes every family member friend, or anyone else who knew the person before the accident. It's 56 hours total across all of them. So if mom has quit her job to take care of her son and has a grown daughter who would give mom some relief a day or two a week, they can only claim 56 hours between the both of them. Now, I'm not great with math, but even I can see that 56 can only cover one person for eight hours each day. But some patients have to be turned every two hours to prevent bed sores. That takes two people to turn a patient, and two people cuts even further into the 56 hours. Those bed sores, well, they can literally lead to a patient's death. There are so many details to consider and a plethora of different, I don't know, characters, if you will, in this true story. There's the Michigan Catastrophic Care Association, the MCCA, the Brain Injury Association of Michigan, the Coalition to Protect Auto No Fault, 
the Department of Insurance and Financial Services, the Michigan Health and Hospital Association, insurance companies, insurance adjuster companies, lobbyists, lawyers, the Insurance Alliance of Michigan, legislators, the governor, the patients, the patients' families. It's a lot. As I talked with some of them, ideas about the why behind the what started bubbling up. Everyone is wondering why this is happening. Why did the governor go back on her promised veto? Why did Republicans champion this legislation in the first place? Why was there no public testimony allowed? Why no public scrutiny? Why did they pass it in the middle of the night? Who ends up benefiting from this? Since July 2nd, at least 41 healthcare provider companies have gone out of business, leaving thousands of people without a job. Patients are being dropped off at emergency rooms. Others are being put into nursing homes that are ill-equipped to care for them. Five people have already died. At least one has gone missing after being discharged from an ER visit. I've talked to two so far who are going to lose their homes this year because of that cut in attendant pay. Can you imagine passing legislation that pushes a traumatic brain injury patient, a child, onto the street? Can you imagine finding out you've done that and doing absolutely nothing to stop it? What's happening in Michigan makes no sense. On the surface, it does not appear that anyone is benefiting from this legislation. The insurance rates haven't gone down. The governor doesn't look good for having held hands with people from the opposing party to pass this. The legislators don't look good for having championed a reform that's hurting people and setting the scene for a massive tax burden on the state in short order. Patients are being hurt. Families are in financial peril with medical bankruptcies looming. Who is winning here? Well, I mean, I guess the insurance companies are. Remember how before they had to meet a certain payout before they could pass their claims onto the MCCA fund? In 2019, that payout was about $580,000. Well, now they don't have to worry about every single one of their clients requiring a $580,000 payout in the event of a catastrophic collision. Now those patients can choose a lower amount of coverage. $500,000, $250,000. 100,000? Some are even eligible to not have MCCA coverage at all. They said they were passing this legislation to help people who couldn't afford auto insurance, and yet they impacted the tiniest portion of the insurance premium, the MCCA fee. And by making it cheaper to have insurance without MCCA coverage, they're setting up low-income people to have insurance that will leave them bankrupt if they're in an accident. It makes no sense. I mean, unless you own an insurance company. Is that what this is all about at the end of the day? More profits for insurance companies? Call me Pollyanna, but I just, I can't accept that insurance companies would advocate for, get past, and stand by legislation that results in death. Surely we haven't regressed in our capitalism so far that we'll let people die for a buck. Or maybe we would. Or maybe that's not the underlying story at all. I do know I can't get to the bottom of this only doing Zooms and phone calls from my home here on an island off the coast of Florida. So I'm going to Michigan to keep digging. People have agreed to come on this show and tell us their stories and knowledge directly. Experts who head up companies and organizations on both sides of this issue have been invited on. Some have accepted. Others we're still reaching out to. Patients and their families have been invited to tell us their stories. Some have agreed. Others are holding back. Some of those holding back are in negotiations with their insurance companies to get their care reinstated. I know of at least one who's been offered a lucrative contract that would continue her child's care if she promises to shut up about the changes to auto no fault. Yeah, that's happening too. I hope you'll lend these people your ear. Maybe you'll have some ideas about what's going on that I can run down. We have a Facebook page. Just search for Silent Crash on Facebook and you should find it. We have a web page. Uh, it's at silentcrash.net. If you have theories or questions whose answers would help us unravel the underlying story at play here, please share them and I will follow up. The ongoing Silent Crash in these people's lives deserves our witness, doesn't it? Especially because just by listening, we might be able to make it stop.
Follow and subscribe to Silent Crash, the quiet unraveling of Michigan's auto no-fault and the destruction of lives wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information on what you've heard here and how you can help, visit silentcrash.net. Silent Crash is a production of the 1C Story Network. The show is written by Rebecca Seitz and produced by her and Rebecca Bond Tucker. Post-production services by Zischer LLC. This show is supported by the generous donations of concerned individuals via the Silent Crash GoFundMe effort. Learn more about the 1C Story Network at JustOneC.com. That's J-U-S-T-O-N-E-C dot com. The One Sea Story Network, for the love of stories.